Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to Ordinary Zen Sangha for the second time in a week. And thank you very much, Will, for your generous invitation. And uh, you might expect that I cut right to the chase and we talk about the Tanakh Herding pictures and you go back home happy, clever, filled with Dharma energy. That's not going to happen. Uh, I have to tell you a story and it's uh, concerning a monk who is no longer with us. And he was a Zen master, respected by many. I, I certainly followed him and respected him as one of my teachers. And uh, his name was Subong Sunim. Subong Sunim was a Chinese American born in Hawaii. He practiced with Zen master Sung San for many, many years. And unofficially, everybody considered him the successor. Of course, among many other Dharma lineage holders uh, empowered by Zen master Sung San, but the person who would be unilaterally accepted uh, by Asians, Americans, uh, and Europeans would, would have been him. And unfortunately, he passed away very early. So three years before his departure, he had a retreat in Slovakia. And that's where I met him. We sat for 10 days together. We had a lot of interviews, Kongan interviews. Later, I learned there are many stories with him. And one of them was taking place in New York, in the Hudson Bay. He resided in the East Coast, and his students in New York offered him a boat trip. And on this tour boat, there were some journalists. And there was a cameraman, there was a journalist with a microphone, and they made these very funny and funky interviews with people on the ship. And so Bong Sunin was wearing clothes very similar in color and cut, like mine. And, uh, of course, he was bold, he was very quiet, very collected, very much paying attention, with good presence. So, before long, the crew goes up to him and says, Sir, may I ask you a simple question? I said, of course. What is the most disgusting thing in the world? And, of course, they expected some answers that would appear in these tabloids later. And so Bong Sim says, who are you? And says, I'm a reporter. I work for this and this magazine. Uh, and I just want to ask you a question. That's your job. Who are you? Then he says his name, uh, marital status, the usual everyday stuff. And then so Bong Sim says, that's just your name. That's just your marital status. That's just where you live. But I'm asking, who are you? And a few more steps like this. And the guy goes totally blank. And he says, I don't know. Then Subong Sunim goes, you don't know who you are? Now that's the most disgusting thing in the world. <laughs> so this is a very fine prelude to the Tanox herding pictures, because we believe it's, well, it's a nice Chinese story from the Tang Dynasty. And we learn before long that six pictures are Taoist and uh, four or five are Buddhist. And it's a wonderful synergy or blend of both teachings. And then you go back happy and clever. No, no, no. This is concerning us directly. It's concerning our quest to become a more enlightened person than we are. This is actually, as you've heard from Will, it's a road map. Some signposts where you can actually place yourself without judging yourself or others. If you look at the sequence, the first three, not much happens. First, looking for the tracks, you know? This seems to be totally superfluous. In Hollywood, this would be cut out, you know, because it's not interesting. And next, you see the tracks. Then you see the ox and the butt, the rear end. And it's very brown. So when you start to practice, because fortunately your decisions led you to take up some practice, first you see just cause and effect. 
That's the tracks. That's when you have a first inkling, what am I doing? What am I saying? What am I speaking and feeling and thinking? So these are the first tracks. And sometimes we get that from other people rather than our own insight. And it's actually picture three when something happens. You see the rear end of an ox completely brown, covered with mud. So when you start practicing really, and you directly point to your own mind, you see some parts of your karma that is actually not so nice. It's like when the pressure cooker loses the lid and boom, things begin to appear during meditation. They say, hey, 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 what is going on? I came here to relax or feel better. Or somebody tell me that I'm a better person already because I just showed up here. This is not what's happening. You see all your homework inside and it just poof appears right in your mind's eyes when you sit down for the first time or have a longer retreat because your mind can actually behave itself for many hours without anything significant happening. You can delude yourself into a wonderful dream. But when you really see the rear end of the ox, it can kick, it smells, the head is somewhere hidden, and you have to deal with it already. And uh, the next picture is actually the next chapter, when suddenly the rope of practice appears, and you start to tame your karma. You start to actually become more disciplined, and it's tight. In some versions, the ox tries to pull you down to the marshes or up to the mountains. When you practice, you can think of yourself as high or a low person, and it's a big mistake to do so. So when you actually have the struggle, then you have to fight yourself. Do I practice or not? And more often than not, we explain it away. We explain it to ourselves why we are already Buddhas. Somebody actually told us. We all have Buddha nature. So why struggle? Why not just kick back, relax, have a lemonade, and then pretend that we are in a pretty good situation? If you're honest with yourself, you know this is all illusory. That when you have some discipline, and soon internal discipline, then you can go to the next phase, which is tying the ox to a tree. That's when your practice is autonomous. That's when it's self-evident that you are a practitioner. Because a tree is stronger, usually, than an ox. Imagine a big trunk, Douglas fir, okay? So then, you don't have to worry about yourself anymore, just keep practicing, because your karma actually started to shift. And when it shifts, your patterns inside shift. So this pattern change, when you start to have a center, that's the tree. That's when the ox is tied. That's when your karma will not be stronger than you. Of course, you can always go back to square one if you make a mess. As you heard, it's not a linear process. We are lucky if we can progress very steadily. But most of us, you know, Two steps forward, three steps back. Then four steps forward, three steps back, two steps back, one step back, give up, start again. We are like that. And the next picture is when the front part of the ox, the head and the two front legs, they become white. The rest is still brown. And it's very interesting if you compare it to the third picture that First you saw the rare end and it was brown and you thought that's where it would begin. No, no, no. First you get some wisdom. And the front legs, that is your direction where you go, is followed by the majority, the mass of your karma. So first you have to get some wisdom mind. You have to wake up at least a little bit from your tendencies and habits. And then you know better. You see better. You are less selfish. You are more compassionate. Still, you have a lot of leftover karma. That's okay. But at least the decision maker is clearer than yesterday. 
or last month or last year. And that's when they start to walk. The rider and the ox are actually the closest so far because the man is sitting on the back and playing a flute. Of course, the rope is in the neck of the ox in most cases, but the flute is enough to direct your karma. It's harmony. It is something where most of us can get in this lifetime, but that's not where the picture series end. All right? Then something interesting happens. Usually, there's a mountainside. The man is looking at the mountain, and the ox is there grazing freely. Not even the flute is necessary. The ox has already been tamed and trained, and it's never going far from the owner. Okay? And something even more transcendental happens. That's when you get to the Zen circle. The ox, the man, and nature all disappear. That is this point. In some Korean temples, they do not even draw a Zen circle. They just leave the whole picture totally blank. Usually it's on green background and some black and white frame. There's nothing in it except the background and the frame. And something interesting happens afterwards. The ox never reappears. The young man never reappears. But you see just nature. So the previous one with the circle was substance. And this one where you only see nature without subject or object, without man or ox or mountain separated, it's truth. The sky is blue, trees are green, traffic outside, humming sound. You perceive truth 100% clearly. And the next one after that is correct function. On our path, it's very clear that we would like to help all beings. If you are correctly selfish, you are also helping other beings. If you are selfless, you are also helping other beings. You may ask with your eyes, what is correctly selfish? Have you seen this bumper sticker that your ignorance is not my bliss? That's when you get correctly selfish. And you see that somebody else's ignorance, greed and anger comes to your doorstep. If you want to stay regular and clear and in this usually harmonious lifestyle, you have to have other people get the same. Otherwise, they will want to take it from you. That's the correctly selfish. And the correctly selfless is that we have the same Buddha nature. Let's help each other wake up. No strings attached. No hopes, no fears, no conditions. That's why it's totally selfless. So then, this man is already a master, an elder or senior monk, and he returns to the marketplace or to the city. Sometimes you see the marketplace, sometimes you just see the city, or sometimes you see the person going towards a human habitat, you know, and you see him walking. And the 11th picture, which is usually not in here, and I've seen a few of them in Korea, is the young student kneeling before the teacher, asking for teaching very respectfully. And then the capo alfine, we get to the first, when the young student, having heard instructions, starts to look for the prince of the ox, starts to journey inside. Now, how important the cyclical view is, I cannot emphasize that enough. But you should know that there is an Indian version of this, with elephants and monkeys and black and white, and it starts you know, on the lower right in the family house, and it goes in a kind of slanting, multiple S-curve up with lots of trials and errors, just like this, but with a lot more structure and a lot more explanations, and it ends up in Tushita heaven in the white castle of the gods and the Buddhas. The main difference is not the stages, not the animals, but the fact 
that from Tushita there is no return. This one has a direct feedback to the community where the person came from, the community that actually supports monks and nuns and temples. And that's why Mahayana is actually very conscious of this, that we never leave any single person behind. No one gets left behind. And as you may have heard, one of the most profound vows of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, is that as long as there is even one person in the realm of samsaric existence, so long do I come back and relieve that person from suffering and help that person towards enlightenment. This is the Bodhisattva path in one sentence. It's time for questions, ladies and gentlemen. Who has any? This one is an ongoing story, what we can uh, what you were explaining, or it's about one lifetime. This what so it's like no ongoing many ongoing. lifetimes. Okay, but this this story is that's like, when it gets really interesting. But this story is like because um, right now I'm dealing with something. But a couple of years ago I was dealing with something else. What, hmm? So it's like it's 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 always. Uh, <laughs> or, or, you or, should or, ask your washing machine. <laughs> yeah, this is what I'm saying. So this is one there is any <laughs> end to this laundry that I'm doing with you? No, I, I have a feeling it's like okay, I deal with that with something, and then uh, kind of learn my lesson. I, I, you know, it's not gonna happen. My lesson. How about the others? But I still have who knows how many karmas I took on this lifetime. Okay. Good news is you can help yourself and others at the same time. Yeah. Lessons yeah. you have finished. You can actually help others get through similar problems. Yeah, so why I am aware of like what happened to me, I learned my lesson in helping. I still, I still doing what I got to do and learning from my experiences. Actually, it's not a learning process as much as it's a cleansing process. Ooh, so when you say learning, I'm not arguing with your words. What I want to point out, it's not just more and more intellectual knowledge in your precious brain. It's actually a cleansing process for your clear mirror mind. That's all. Uh -huh. When you feel that you are in a relationship with someone, doesn't matter, it's like a friendship, does, does any type of relationship, you think that you are more aware of things than that person. And I heard it in the past that, you know, this relationship is not going to last because your awareness is not on the same level, kind of type of, I think it's a criticism. But you feel that you belong to, to each other. You feel that, you know, there is something to do um, in life with each other. But, you know, maybe you see that he's suffering more than how much you're suffering. Is that, that still, it's a karmic, it, it is still a karmic relationship when you think that you learn a little bit more than the, your partner? Every relationship is based on karma. There is no relationship without karma. Okay, that's number one. And the biggest question is not some theory around it or somebody else's opinion from the side. The biggest question is, how does the other feel about the same issue? Forget awareness levels. This is preposterous. This is the root of the worst type of arrogance. Do we really believe independently that we belong together? Each one of us, in our hearts, do we honestly believe we want to live with each other? That's the key. Everything else is noise. Find that out from him. You have your ways and means to do that. Don't just ask. There are various situations and relationship types where you can do this by action, by experience. Okay? I uh, noted when you were talking about the back end of the ox, you talked about some of the negative aspects of meditative practice sometimes it's it's uh, seen as being monkey mind or you know what I'd call trivial sorts of things but I think you referred to some some issues that may come up that could be bigger I've sometimes heard that from a, a path perspective called the dark night of the soul and uh, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that because it's not talked about very much and uh, actually the dark night of the soul is not so much a meditation experience as a period in your life when no matter what you do, it's dark. Still you have to hold the torch 
as much as possible above your head. And never lose the beacon. It's like the thread of Ariadne in the labyrinth of the Minotaur for Theseus. So when you're in the labyrinth, that's when you, you really need that thread, that really shiny silver thread, which leads you out of the labyrinth. So in that sense, meditation is preparation. Preparation for that, preparation for extremely good parts of your life. It's preparation for life and death. If you deal with prevention too much, then you actually fall into the trouble that you want to prevent. Because it's always in your mind. So the dark night of the soul is described in many artists and teachers' you know, words. But if you read Dante's, you know, hell, that's really there. And if you have a stronger center and a clearer mind, you get through that dark night much quicker. With less bruises, hurting less people. As far as meditation is concerned, Zen means that we directly point to human mind without symbols, systems, any mitigation or explanation. So that's just your homework appearing right before your mind's eyes. Like someone likes to think of oneself as a very compassionate and peaceful person. And during meditation, this huge fireball of anger appears. And you look inside and say, what? I'm not this kind of person, for Christ's sakes. I can't be so angry. And the answer is, yes, you can. But that's not the last point here. Do you want to be? So when you perceive that, you detach from that, it no longer controls you. You remove the energy from that emotion or passion, and then you have control over it. Each and every karma is made up of energy and information together. You modify one, the other is changing. You remove one, soon the other is removed. You remove energy from any kind of karma, then the information soon falls apart. You remove the information or the identification from any kind of karma, soon the energy becomes free and you can use it again for any kind of purpose. So this is what is meant by the rear end of the ox that unexpectedly your subconscious karma appears on a daily basis. When you practice really hard, weeks or months, then you go deeper and deeper and deeper. And all that Zen teaches you is to be here at this moment. And things of the past, present, and sometimes the future keep appearing in front of you, in front of your mirror. So whatever is the hindrance before you, between you and this moment, that appears. You reflect that, let go of that, become free from that, then the moment becomes clear, clear, and clear. That's it, okay? In st number eight, step number eight, the little man, or the man, attains emptiness. You mean the Zen circle? I do. There is no little man. That's the point. Well, he, okay, he attained, he, was there and now he's not because he's one with or he is just i mean he's on a holiday okay <laughs> very good emptiness t to me connotes neutrality and and so he is one with every neutrality yes that's already not emptiness you made neutrality return to this point I'm not taking away your toys. I'm teaching you how to be spiritually adult. It's different. Neutrality, mistake. Duality, also mistake. Come back to don't know. Okay. True don't know is emptiness. I guess neutrality is cheating. The do In other words, I, I was substituting neutrality for don't know. But it was not a good analogy. So. You can't get away with it. I know. Can't get away with anything with you. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, go on. Go on. Okay, so I see that someone, the man who no longer exists, mm -hmm. has attained what I would say to be nirvana. But I'm not through. That's just a statement. It's not the question. Then 
he, he reappears with love in his heart uh, and does his, and and um, executes the mandate of the Bodhisattva, which is to leave no one out. All of a sudden, out of emptiness comes love all of a sudden. Yes. But I see love as a, a mechanism of survival. Really? Like, yes. You're, you're back to square one. But it does, bio, I mean, it just, as I look at it biologically, how, where did the love come from? There is no biology in here. Well, That's where all right, it came well from. then just scratch that. Where does the love come out of emptiness? Emptiness is not empty, okay? Originally, it means complete emptiness or empty completeness. That's the Sanskrit word shunyata. So when your mind as an individual is gone, you totally become one with another person's consciousness. That's a state of mind beyond any description. And you cannot not be compassionate, but you also have your wisdom there, okay? Non-dualistic wisdom, unconditional compassion. I don't want to explain this too much. I just want to give you an example. During my first 90 day retreat, we really kept silence. It was East Coast Providence, Rhode Island, a really strong winter. We went to zero degrees Fahrenheit, ladies and gentlemen. And I heated the monastery two months out of three. It was hard work. It was very good retreat, very good teacher, super Sangha. Half of them monastics. Most of them I saw same year in Korea. Other half lay people, some of them Dharma teachers, so no small deal. People really knew what they were doing. And we kept our mouth shut. I met all of those people for the first time in my life a few days before the retreat. At the very end, there was a person next to me. Retreat was over. We really didn't want to talk again too much because you want to kind of savor that and keep that, knowing that you can't. In the long run, the world will eat it up. And I had an extra uh, toothpaste. And suddenly, guided by this don't know, I bring the toothpaste and lay it down right in front of her. She looks at me and says, that's exactly what I needed. I just ran out of it yesterday. That's how it works. And then it becomes part of your everyday life, your experience, not just with your family and friends, maybe people on the train or the aircraft. So when you are not attached to your own karma, you can really reflect other people's minds. And that's the root of compassion. It's not an emotional posture. If compassion was an emotional posture, then all grandmothers would be Buddhas, but they're not, <laughs> unfortunately. I would love grandmothers to be Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, but they also have some homework. So not an emotional posture, not a specific set of thoughts. It comes from something much deeper, much simpler, much more profound, and that is this one mind. So when you become one, then naturally compassion arises, wisdom arises, selfless help arises. Okay? Awesome. I get it. Thank w you. Way to go. You're welcome. <laughs> more questions? You mentioned on Wednesday about being in the mountains, yes. and you met that herdsman, and you realized he was... Super clear. Super clear. Can you put more words on that? No. More of a description? You can't? I would like to introduce you to him. Come to Europe. We go up to the mountains, you'll see him face to face. That's all. I can't bring the person here. And I would do a disservice to him if I just wanted to describe it. You just did an example of the toothpaste. That's and my karma. I know that. But to but him, I, mean this I don't do that. <laughs> oh, okay. So inside of you, you really want to meditate. It's something is always there. And you have what, it has been years and years. And there was time when I was meditating and then just like, you know, I just slipped. And I, I know it's how essential is that. How can I, because I know I want to I really would like to just uh, as a daily basis, and I'm sure that I'm not alone. It's like what you, yeah. it's like okay. discipline. Mm. Mm. So there is something within me, which is mm. sabotaging the whole. Sabotage. Do not use your wooden shoes, the sabo, because the sabotage comes from these wooden shoes that we used, you know, vi very violently.
you can go the easy way or the hard way. Which one do you want? <sighs> Which hurt less? <laughs> easy. The easy way hurts less, but requires more autonomy, more self-discipline, more recognition. You kind of sit down with yourself and you reason. And then you have a compromise that, okay, most important, next important, less important, unimportant. And you have that, that kind of hierarchy in your mind. And you follow that. That's the easy way. The hard way is that you realize, I'm not going to listen. Whatever happens, I just do what I want and meditation is excluded from that. So to persuade yourself, you have to make some mistake. So go into a challenge, which is a double or nothing type of situation. If you make it, you jump to the next level. But if you don't, you go so deep that there's no way you wouldn't want to meditate. That's the hard way. Whichever you choose. The um, ox is brown and then it turns to white. Does it turn all the way white? And what is the significance of that? The back end of it's brown and then does all of it, because I don't see that necessarily in here, but it's... All of it becomes white? That's the good news. There's no bad news. But it's the usual function of your mind that it shows the rare end first. It shows the brown, the kind of dusty, dirty, muddy part first. You don't go to nirvana straight away without paying a price. So, that's it. The question is very simple then how can we work easier on our karmas, which is constantly popping up in life? Do you find an easy way to breathe? Yeah. So what is the easy way to breathe? Just do it. Good. That's the easy way to meditate and work with your karma. Oh, okay. Thank you. My wife recently passed. She was only 53. She was a Buddhist from Thailand. I'm sorry to hear that. She had such dignity. When she was, she got pre, uh, pancreatic cancer yeah. so quick, yeah. and I, I was her caregiver, and she just was so peaceful and accepting, and I had the hardest time. And we talk about the karma. I've meditated for many years. I, it was just hard for me to go through this, and I don't get the karma about. We could talk about that karma, but it's not useful anymore. No. We can talk about you. I want to talk about Your me. karma. Because she's karma. gone. She's gone. You can chant Jijang Bosa for her. That means you invoke all the celestial guides and teachers to guide her on her way. But if she was Buddhist, if she practiced, if she understood the teaching at whatever level she did, don't worry about her. She's on her way. Whatever we experience after our departure is dependent only on the way we lived. So don't worry, just keep this moment very clear. Don't lose your mirror. You need to go through the mourning process 100%. You're not done. No. You still believe that there is somehow a way to bring her back. I know she's gone. In your mind, yes. In your heart, no. The hardest part is the emotional part. And that's why I suggest you do some chanting. Chanting will take all of this away and transform this energy into new emotions, fresh emotions, not related to her. It's not uncompassionate to say that. She's gone. You go through the mourning process. You still live. She left her body behind. Your Paths have separated. And you bow to your time, you bow to her together. And after you have done all that, a new chapter should open in your life because that's how it is on this earth. There are three important things. Expressing the fullest and most sincere appreciation for everything you went through together with her. The second is making amends and expressing your repentance for the mistakes that you couldn't say sorry for while she was alive. I got to do that. And the third is farewell. So, thank you, I'm sorry, goodbye. But these are three labels for three very big boxes. 
And if you are through, then you are new. If you still feel inside, recoiling, returning back to the past, then the mourning process is not finished. Um, so when we move on and de departure, mm -hmm. then we leave our body behind. It's a lot, the quality how we, the wisdom and the quality of our life, uh, how can I say? Um, let me help you here. Zen Master Pai Chang wrote many, many teaching poems. And one went like this. If you die tomorrow, what kind of body will you get? Isn't this the most important question for your mind? Hurry up, hurry. Clouds float up to the heavens. Water flows down to the sea. Wonderfully, you keep pointing out that we're on this path. And we really need to sincerely ask the questions that this is life and death. And when we recognize that, mm -hmm. then we're going to sincerely pursue our lives. So when I look at the ox herding pictures, the circle after the circle is just nature. I would like to explore that a little bit because to me, nature inward, outward nature is the same nature. And because we live in this society that is constant turmoil, constantly attracting us to something, wanting to steal our energy one way or another. Yeah. How often do we really hear a bird song? Hear the cicadas? See the clouds disappearing? feel the grass under our feet? Are we really alive? To me, that picture talks about being really alive. You know, nature, as our Buddha nature, is this no name, no form essence which penetrates everything. Sung San Sunim wrote a poem, it is enlightenment nature, he says. It is apparent in all things. Without cultivation, you are already complete. Then this stick and its sound and your mind, are they the same or different? If you say they are the same, I hit you 30 times. If you say they are different, I also hit you 30 times. What can you do? Hot! Harom sor harom egyenlő kilenc. Three times three equals nine. So the three times three equals nine is exactly this picture when you see nature as birds and trees and forests and lakes with your own nature, which is this no name, no form, no life, no death. And what our Taoist forefathers actually realized that if we truly returned to our true nature, we'll be just as spontaneous, selfless, clear and functioning as nature herself. And that's why if you practice in nature, all the trees, the mountains, the birds teach us. But we won't be green like the trees, we won't sing like the birds, we won't just stand like the mountains, but their function, their being, the way they exist, can actually teach us how we should exist as humans. Dog understands dog's job. Cat understands cat's job. Why don't humans understand human's job? That's it. That's when we return to nature, and nature helps us return to our true self, our true nature. I'd like uh, you to address the concepts of commitment and discipline. Uh, I was reading a, a Taoist passage today and um, it, it was actually a poem and that was part of the um, the message and I do see I see commitment in here when he when he takes the rope and um, goes through all of the um, difficulties of holding on to the ox, ox, um, and then uh, the discipline of of his 
his just, journey. Yeah. When I see my practice and my path, it's a refuge. And here, this is struggle. And I don't see it as struggle. I see it as where I go to, I don't want to say escape because that's pretty heavy, but to um, remove myself from struggle. It's, it's a beautiful um, refuge for me. So that is not analogous to this. It's an I have some wonderful teaching for you tonight. In the Tanakh's herding pictures, you can take ten kinds of refuge. In the first, take refuge in the search. In the second, take refuge in the footprints. In the third, take refuge in the huge brown rear end of the ox. In the fourth, take refuge in the struggle. In the fifth, take refuge in the rope, you know, being tied to a tree, and so on and so forth. You can take refuge in anything if you have the correct relationship to it. Not separation, not identification. Then your mind mirror really works correctly. So just reflect, just relate, just connect and just do it. That's correct refuge. This earth is changing. Every single atom, every single phenomena, everything changes all the time. Where can you take refuge? So you attain yourself, you attain your true nature, that's the only refuge. Then you can take refuge in each and every one of them. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Well, my question before this was, how do you take refuge? I never quite understood it in the Buddhist teachings. And I've heard it with many of my teachers that I've gone to, but I thought I was supposed to take it with, with a monk. Actually, taking precepts depends on a precepts teacher, but it's not the same as taking refuge. You can take refuge even tonight. You bow three times to the Buddha, mm -hmm. the Dharma, and the Sangha, and you say, please teach me. Then, I'd like to understand the Dharma. And then, thank you very much for teaching me. That's it. That's basic refuge. So when you say, Namu Bulta Bujong Kwanin Bophe, Namu Tarma Bujong Kwanin Bophe, Namu Sunga Bujong you do just exactly that. Little different words. And I'm thinking in doing the three bows, which I've been doing since our workshop, I'm going to find my true purpose and how to serve others. It seems like that's coming to me more clearly. Is that possible? It is possible. If you really want to do this, I suggest you do more than three bows yes, per day. We got to work up to this. <laughs> you need some really strong energy reserves and clarity and solidity so that people would not misuse your intention. Don't give more or less than necessary. Do it in the right way, then your job with that person is finished. You don't want them to depend on you, but you also want to help them. Your job is finished when they become autonomous with your help and they go on their way. So like with Amelia, don't do it for Don't them. ignore them, don't bind them. Mm. This is following up on some of the questions about the difficulty of meditating and uh, discipline and, and technique and perhaps broadening out even a little bit further into other Buddhist disciplines. When I meditate, I um, am pretty good about getting into the refuge point, um, but I lack concentration. And um, I would consider myself to be uh, a lower level meditator. And I want to be able to, to develop some content concentration. And um, a few people have told me that uh, Vipassana can be a way of, of um, very specific techniques to, ver to help to get to kind of a foundational level, I guess, in terms of concentration and awareness, and can be a, a for want of a better word, a launching pad, um, you know, back into a, a Mahayana um, view of the world or, or, or universe. Um, I was just wondering if, if you have experience with that or, or uh, in terms of leveraging those sorts of tools or... or All right. Each and every tradition is complete. 
they do not serve as each other's launching pads. Otherwise, I would be misrepresenting Theravada if I said yes. And Mahayana also doesn't need a launching pad outside of itself. You can begin and go to intermediate and advanced at high level in each and every tradition of your choice. Okay? And I suggest you do that. And uh, we all need teachers. Teachers, they make any kind of self-reflection or qualification of our own practice totally superfluous. You don't have to gauge your own meditation practice where you are. And they really teach you what you need to have and not what you want to get. So I suggest that you really do your shopping in the spiritual shopping mall. <laughs> Be careful with the checkout because what you take home will sit on your bookshelf. Establish your Alpha tradition. The Alpha tradition is where you really trust the teacher, you want to study the Dharma, and you can harmonize with the Sangha. And that's the Alpha. Usually, in a different way, it's like falling in love. No questions asked. <coughs> questions are asked later when you move together. Okay? That's different. <laughs> but when you really fall in love, there's no question. You just want to be with her all the time. Okay? It's like that. You find your tradition, you find your teacher, you find the Sangha. It's click, snap. You, you just want to be there. And that's it. Then you, of course, check the direction. Is this really going where I want to go? then you have heart-to-heart -heart conversations with the teacher. Then it becomes a very, I would say, tactical decision. Does the tradition that you choose present enough challenges and opportunities? These two must be there so that you would lose enough of your karma and you could also see yourself progress on the path. The Dharma practice is not really a reward game with coupons, you know. Fill this out, and then you get five dollars back. You know, it's just, hello, it's, what are we talking about? You get that super cheap package of nirvana off the shelf. Put it into your microwave. You're Buddha. So, it, hello? So, this is very, very different. The way that these traditions were made was really before market capitalism appeared, people. So, it doesn't behave like a consumer article. It never will. So establish the Alpha, and then you can always have kind of trips to other traditions, knowing where you are rooted. And if you have a correct teacher and a good Sangha, they will not term loyalty as being locked up in just one place and never looking left or right. Go straight, but keep your mind open. Keep your eyes open. Some good teacher comes to town of a different tradition, go visit. Pay your respects, learn to relate, to adapt, to practice, and then bring back the benefits. Okay? Thank you. More questions? I had the honor of taking the precepts from you, and um, I was absolutely sure at that point that I was going to be um, lily white for the rest of my life. <laughs> and that was just two or three days ago, and I've already told a fib of convenience and so it's not going the way i thought it would and i feel Wonderful. very badly imagine about it imagine that it did i would have a, such a hard time to teach you if it went just the way you wanted this is, what are we doing then let's go ahead What's your question? that's it so what should i expect of myself can you just not go into uh, ftl with your precepts you know what is ftl mm -mm. faster than light Everything on this earth is slower than light. Nothing can accelerate to that speed. So be patient. Your precepts are already working in your subconscious beautifully. Just keep up your everyday life as if nothing had happened. Yes, that's what you needed to hear. You know it happened. You know it started to transform you. You know it started to transform the way you live your life. Let that happen naturally. And don't go into overdrive, trying to break the light barrier, okay? Yes. I definitely get that. Thank you. You remember the tale of Icarus, the Greek man who actually used wax to put the feathers of a bird. Yes. And he just wanted to fly to the sun. 
don't let the wax melt. Fabulous. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I find it so easy to forgive others their transgressions. And yet I hold on to these, my own transgressions from the past that seem to me unforgivable. And I'd like to figure out how to have more compassion for myself. If you like do not is. forgive and forget your own transgressions, you cannot 100% forgive others. So the way to end this is really forgive others 100% and have compassion towards others 100%, then your own karma be begins to grow less and less and less and less. The problem with compassion towards myself is that there's only one of you. So which one feels compassion to who? It's a paradox that you don't want to get into. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we congratulate ourselves, or we are proud of ourselves, we are compassionate to oneself, or brash to oneself. This is all a mind game. I'm not judging you. I'm pointing out how the mind works, and we want to defuse and dismantle some of these superfluous functions. You want to experience compassion? Recycle it. Recycle it through another person, a group, an animal, anyone who can radiate it back to you, depending on the way you gave that compassion. And that's when it gets back to you. That's when you can actually relax and look at yourself and put the past into the past. In terms of ourselves, we learn our lessons, but we don't have to have a special emotional attitude towards our karma once it's in the right place. But while you are judging yourself, you are still identified with your karma. And uh, the environment keeps judging you all the time. So when you have a correct relationship with your own karma, then you can be compassionate to the other people around you, all beings, and that comes back to us in the right way. Thank you for your question. It was very important. I'd like you to just, again, um, maybe overview the 10 ox herding in terms of the teachings where they come. Rewind the tape. No, no, not, no I'm not overviews. talking about individually. I'm talking about historically. You know, historically, they're from two traditions, I heard you say. The Indians also have a tradition with it. But in the teachings of, say, your, what you've gone through, or say for us, how, how should we look at these, and, and, you know, I don't want to say importance of our path, but obviously you thought enough of them to make a talk of it tonight. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand where they fall in my path that I'm on in studying this or being in this in terms of the whole historical. Does that make sense to you? Do you understand what I'm asking? I understand your words. I understand what you'd like. But I need to convince you that you're not asking the right question. It's not the historical view that would help you. It's not positioning you on the path that would help you. But you actually practicing every day, that's what would help you. I've answered the questions of each and every one of you. You are no exception, but this answer will be a little bit different. Do it. And your own practice experience will put you to the right place and give you the perspective that I can repeat for you. But next day, you will want another one. Monday, you will want another one. And then the mind, because it's insatiable. We want images all the time. We want some flow that can make our lives eventful. The danger of this is that it can substitute practice for us in our sense. That you're endowed with some knowledge. That somebody did the legwork for you. Now, teachers necessarily have more experience than the students. That's fine. But another overview will not help. You already understand enough. So I encourage you to do practice in three ways. In a Sangha, 
in a group regularly and not once a month, at least once a week. Next, individually at home, also formal practice. And the third is extend that outside of the form and use the Dharma in everyday life, in every situation, every relationship, and every type of function that you perform, do it with a practicing mind. Do it with a clear mind. And that moment to moment updates your view on the world. Refreshes the Dharma that you learned and integrates you into society and makes you an integrated person as well at the same time. So at this point, I'd like to appreciate your precious attention that you attended this talk too, the second in a row, in a week. I want to thank Will for his wonderful practice and teaching you guys, taking care of you. And um, I have to say, you should feel really good because you are in good hands. So please help him and support him so that this wonderful Dharma can flourish here and help more people. Thank you very much.